Okay, everyone. Welcome to the VW Diesel Diesel Emissions Mitigation Program Round Two webinar. Um, just want to go over some initial items first before we begin. Due to the amount of people attending this webinar, there will be unit upon entry. Uh, if you have any questions during the presentation, please enter them in the chat window. Um, we will record the questions as they come in. We'll try to answer as many as possible at the end of the presentation. Uh, if you could, please select everyone when you're typing in your question. Uh, to enter the chat, if you don't know how to get to it, if you're on a desktop, just click the chat button at the bottom of the screen. Uh, if you're on a mobile device, select participants at the bottom of the screen, then click the chat button at the next screen. Uh, please limit your questions to programmatic questions. If you have questions about your specific project, please email them to us. Uh, you can use the link at our VW website or the email address will be displayed later during the presentation. The slides along with the recording of this webinar are being recorded and will be posted on the VW site within a week or so. So with that, I'll leave it up to Keisha. Hi everyone, uh, thanks for joining us today for the VW Grant Program Round 2 webinar. Um, just to give you an overview of who you most likely be touching base with uh, on anything VW related. Um, here's the list of people. Uh, in the planning and standards division, and more specifically in mobile social group, uh, Paul Fire is the director. Um, myself, Makisha is the supervisor of mobile social group, and the group is made up of well, Jennifer Ariente, Lou Corsino, Sharon Gustav, Patrice Kelly, Kate Knight, Paul Quick Plus, Dan Glock. Chan Glock gave them an application for this round two program. You will see one of these names on the correspondence. So, just an overview of what to expect in the webinar. Um, we're going to give a, a brief background on the VW element. I know a lot of you are probably familiar with it, but some people are probably new to the the program. Um, we'll also give an overview or a summary of what happened with round one, what to expect on the round two, and a walkthrough of the application form and instruction. Um, we're also going to give some answers to some common questions that we've received uh, over time, and we'll provide you with uh, contact information should you have any questions after the webinar. And we'll also, at the end of the session, take programmatic questions about the BW grant program. So, by way of background, um, back in 2008, EPA came up with more stringent standards for diesel engines. And following that, Volkswagen, about a year later, started installing software on their diesel vehicles so that when the vehicles were being tested, they would appear to meet these new stringent standards. About four, five years later, an independent research was done, and those researchers found that the emissions from those vehicles when they were operating normally on the road were significantly higher than what the test results show. EPA, I'm sorry, VW eventually acknowledged that this was the case, and it turned out that more than 11 million vehicles globally were affected by these devices, and 12,000 of those vehicles were in Connecticut. Following VW's um, admission, the California District Court and EPA, along with VW, came to an agreement, which was the settlement. Um, it was it was the result of several consent decrees, and essentially, what the 
aim of these consent decrees was was to ensure that those NOx emissions that these 11 million vehicles um, put out would be offset by the funds that are being set aside on these trucks. So the entire trust was a significant amount more than, than what's listed here, but the environmental mitigation trust piece of, of the settlement, Appendix C, was approximately $3 billion. And the aim was to use that fund or use those funds to support environmental programs to offset non emissions from the heavy cars. Of that three billion dollars, Connecticut was allocated approximately sixty-six million dollars. Um, to access those funds, Connecticut had to become a trust beneficiary. And once those funds were accessed, Connecticut had ten years to spend down that allocation. There is a potential for that $66 million increase depending on whether or not other states that have achieved beneficiary status on the trust have spent down their allocation in the specified time. If they have not, the funds will be redistributed among each other beneficiaries. Uh, for those with audio issues, we're going to take a quick two-minute break and try to fix the audio issues. Uh, so if you're with us, hopefully the sound will be a bit better when we come back. Thanks. We're going to change the dial Testing, testing, I'm going to pretest the audio now. I unmuted you. Okay. Uh, can everyone hear us a little bit better now? Is that any better? Please type in the chat window. Thank you. Yes, much better. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Sorry about that. Okay. All right, we're going to pick up here. Looks like audio is better. Take it away. <laughs> Okay, so I'll, I'll go over the last slide, just, you know, uh, because it was terrible. Um, so under the, the settlement, the VW settlement, um, an environmental mitigation trust was established, and that trust consisted of approximately $3 billion for projects that would offset the NOx emitted by the uh, tempered VW cars. Um, of that $3 billion, Connecticut was allocated approximately $56 million. Um, but to allocate those funds, or uh, to access those funds, Connecticut had to become a beneficiary of the trust. Um, once beneficiary status was received, Connecticut had 10 years to spend on those dollars. They also, we also have the opportunity to increase that $56 million should any other beneficiary under the trust not spend their allocation within the specified time. So um, this is pretty much an overview of, of 
the steps Connecticut took to um, launch the first round of the VW program. So after the trust became effective, we submitted to the trustee, Wilmington Trust, um, documentation naming DEEP as the lead agency for Connecticut funds. Following that, we obtained our beneficiary status on the trust in January of 2018, and in April of that same year, we submitted our final mitigation plan to Wilmington Trust. The mitigation plan was, as, as I stated, was re required by the, the trust, and um, what we decided to do with our plan was to, to keep it as broad as the trust. So, uh, almost any eligible category that was, or any category that was eligible under the trust was eligible under our, our plan. We submitted an initial draft, a public, or we made public an initial draft back in February of 2017. We held an informal public meeting, meeting at that time, and we also had an open comment period. We then had a final draft um, noticed in February of 2018. We held a comment period for that as well. And following those two periods, we posted response to comments and subsequent to that, submitted our final plan to the trustee. If anyone would like details on the plan, it's available on the VW website. You can access that at any time. Basically, the plan is, it covers everything in the trust. So we, we wanted to maintain the flexibility of the trust. So all those eligible project areas in the trust are eligible project areas in our grant program. Um, one of the goals of the plan and of our program is to realize immediate NOx reductions and we are also hoping that of the projects received, of the variety of projects we have received in the past and, and hope to receive again in this round, will consist of innovative projects that may present opportunities for transfer and replication in other fleets uh, and other project areas. So another thing that the plan stipulates, the, the trust allows for 15% of the allocated funds to be used on electric vehicle supply equipment. Um, our mitigation plan commits to doing that. Uh, we haven't to date released an EVSC grant program. The intent is still to do so following the release of the EV roadmap. We're also allowed to use up to 15% of the funding for administrative costs, and the balance will be used for the other nine project categories under the trust. So now we'll give you a, an overview of round one. This is Patrice Kelly, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we did with round one and give you a little background on round two. The project solicitation period for round one began May 30th and ended July 31st of 2018. In that time, 56 proposals were received, most of them in the last week, requesting $31.7 million. From those 56 proposals, we selected 10 and adjusted the funding to provide $11.8 million. Now you will notice, and you will, some of you will remember that we offered seven and a half million, and I'll, I'll explain the difference in a moment. Projects have to be completed by March 31st of 2020. Since the awards in, in November, the awardees and DEEP have entered into project implementation plans with defined milestones and requirements. At the close of these projects, after they're completed, 
The payment will come directly from the Wilmington Trust. Round one awardees are listed here. You will notice that the Connecticut Department of Transportation received $4.9 million. That was the difference between the 7.5 that we originally offered and the 11.9 that we actually gave. It was because of the nature of that project, and we'll talk a little bit later about what a transformative project is. But when they offered to com uh, convert 12 diesel buses, replace 12 diesel buses with 12 electric buses, we considered that to be a transformative project and exercised our right to add a little more money to the pot. The other um, propo the successful proposals are listed here. The total that we offered, again, is, was $11,777,922. We got a delightfully diverse array of projects. We have 12 electric transit buses, two electric shuttle buses, 16 new compressed natural gas refuse trucks, 46 new diesel tool buses, one commercial ferry repower, and that involves six engines, and 51 new commercial diesel trucks. The estimated reductions from the 10 selected projects, and this is what we're talking about later, the importance of the NOx reductions. We have 83.2 tons of NOx, nitrogen oxides reduced annually, a lifetime reductions of 151.4 tons of NOx, lifetime CO2 reductions, that's otherwise known as greenhouse gas, uh, 7,981 tons reduced. Lifetime VOC, that's volatile organic compounds, also known as hydrocarbons, 9.8 tons. And lifetime uh, reductions of fine particulate matter, PM 2.5, 6.9 tons. Cost effectiveness from the VW share was $77,744 per ton. Now that sounds like a lot, but in our business, we often see projects come in at around a million dollars a ton, so we were very pleased with this. What did we learn from the lesson one uh, program, around one program? Uh, primarily, we learned that the municipal projects involving one or two vehicles were not competitive with private projects involving 15 or more vehicles due to the scale and the cost effectiveness. We learned very quickly that the application form could have been a lot clearer. We also learned that the selection criteria should have been better defined in the program documents. We also, and it's not listed here, uh, did learn that if we had, had asked for more material up front, it would have made our processing time a lot more efficient. So we've tried to incorporate all these lessons in round two, and we, when we get to discussing the process of, for round two, we will cover some of that. So now we come to the background and uh, set up for round two. Once again, we're offering funding of seven and a half million dollars. The application period opened last Thursday, October, August 1st, and the proposal deadline will be September 16th. It's open to government and non-government entities, and it covers all the eligible categories in the uh, trust, on-road, heavy duty and medium duty trucks and buses, airport ground support equipment, forklifts, port cargo handling equipment, commercial marine vessels, shore power for ocean going vessels, and freight switchers. At a later date, we will launch a program for electric vehicle and other zero emission vehicle uh, fueling systems. This is a reimbursement program. You have to spend the money first, and then we pay you back. Projects initiated prior to filing an application are not eligible for funding. This gets a lot of questions, so I'm going to give you a little bit more of the definition behind that. What activities can disqualify you as being uh, initiated prior to application? These can be approving the, the project in a budget initiating an RFP for the project, selecting a vendor, ordering the vehicle's equipment or engines, or hiring a contractor. Any of those activities 
prior to the application can render it ineligible. Projects and final paperwork must be completed by April 30th, 2021. The funding will be awarded through an open, competitive, and transparent process. Matching funds are required for all projects. We hope to have uh, the awards released in time to allow anyone unsuccessful in applying for VW the opportunity to apply for DERA funds. This is EPA's Diesel Emission Reduction Act program. Funding priorities. DEEP will select projects to be funded based on the funding priorities outlined in the State of Connecticut Mitigation Plan in addition to a set of preferential criteria outlined in the application form and instructions. This is new for this round. Non-government and government projects will be evaluated independently for round two. For reference purposes, the ranking methodology using for the, used for the first round of funding is available on our webpage. The ranking methodology for this round has not been finalized and may differ from round one. Eligible projects. These are taken directly from the settlement documents. We don't have much leeway in these. Uh, the, the items that are covered are all of the items that are eligible from the settlement. For on-road heavy-duty vehicles and medium-duty vehicles, we have class four to eight local freight trucks. Now these don't have to be hauling freight. They could be hauling refuse. They could be a muni municipal truck hauling salt or mulch or uh, gravel. Uh, they can be used for a variety of purposes, but the category is called freight trucks. Port drage trucks, these do haul freight and they have to have a certain amount of time tra traversing between ports and other destinations. We also, on the on-road heavy duty vehicle category, we have class four through eight school, shuttle, and transit buses. To be eligible for a truck, you must have an engine model year no earlier than 1992 and no later than 2009. For buses, the engine model years must be 2009 and older. What, what amount of payment can we give you for the, the heavy duty on road projects? Well, you're gonna see this a lot. For any government sponsored projects, it's 65% for any of the options. For repowering, that's replacing an engine, for replacing, for repowering with all electric, for replacing with all electric, the maximum that we can give you is 65%. For non-government projects, there's a lot more variability. If you're putting a new diesel or alt fuel engine into your truck, we can give you up to 40%. If you're replacing a truck with a new, or bus with a new diesel or alt fuel vehicle, we can give you up to 25%. We can give you up to 60% if you repower or replace with an all electric engine or vehicle. Non-road equipment. This is frustratingly narrow. There are all that we are eligible are airport ground support equipment, forklifts, and these have to be able to carry 8,000 pounds, and port cargo handling equipment. For the ground support equipment, the uh, eligibility is uh, tier zero to two. Forklifts, reach stackers, side loaders, and top loaders with 8,000 pounds lift capacity or greater. Uh, port equipment, rubber tired gantry cranes, style carriers, shuttle carriers, and terminal tractors, including yard hostlers and yard tractors that operate within ports. Now, the trick with these is the only replacements and repowers that are allowed are all electric. So you get up to 65% if you're a government applicant, up to 60% if you're a non-government applicant. Commercial marine vessels. The only eligible marine vessels here are ferries and tugs. No fishing vessels in this, this group for, for VW funding. We also have shore power equipment. This is essentially a plug that sits on deck so that when your big ship pulls into the, the port, it can plug in and you don't have to run your uh, diesel powered generator to provide power to the ship. For government projects, once again, you have 
uh, to repower uh, a ferrier tug with new diesel or alt fuel, or to repower with electric, or, or to cover and to cover the costs associated with the shoreside system. If it's a non-government project, 40% to repower with new diesel or alt fuel engine, fuel engine, 60% to repower with all electric, and 25% to cover the costs associated with the shoreside system. Locomotives. Eligible equipment are freight switches, no long haul locomotives. Eligibility criteria, you have to have a pre-tier four switcher locomotive that can be demonstrated to have operated 1,000 or more hours per year in, 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 in advance of your application. Again, government projects, 65%, for repower with diesel or alt fuels, replace this but you notice you can replace a switcher with a new diesel or alt fuel switcher, uh, repower with all electric, re or, or replace with all electric, all up to 65%. For a non-government project, it's up to 40% if you repower with new diesel or alt fuel engines, 25% if you replace with new diesel or alt fuel switcher, and 65% if you repower or replace with electric equivalents. Now we're trying to time this so that it aligns with the DIRA, the EPA Diesel Emission Reduction Act funding. Uh, the DIRA eligibility is broader than BW. There's a lot more non-road uh, or uh, marine opportunities in the DIRA program. And if you're a non-government applicant, the re reimbursement rates are quite similar, and it's like approximately 25% or 40% for a repower, 25 for replacement and 40 for repower. The solicitation period for this year's DERA program will open October 1st. You may apply for both the VW and DERA, but you can only be funded under one. If you are selected for funding, under the VW program, and you have also applied under DIRA, there's no penalty for withdrawing your proposal. You will not be selected for both. The funding available is at least $670,800, and it will be, depending on the demand, it can be increased uh, with, DIRA, with VW funding. The application deadline will be November 18th, 2019, and the projects have to be completed by August 31st, 2020. You notice that's only one year uh, be to, before it's uh, completed and instead of the three years that are allowed under BW. Good afternoon, this is Jennifer Arianti. Now we're gonna be doing the application information for round two. We will begin discussing the application form. The application form and instructions are available at BW's website. If you are applying for funds for more than one source category, for example, on-road vehicles and non-road equipment, a separate application should be used for each eligible source category project. Improvements have been made to application forms based on feedback from round one applicants and deep staff. Therefore, these round two forms differ from round one. On the website is the zip file, which contains entire application package. Part one, applicant information. This section asks for basic contact information. It is important to have an accurate and working email address. We may contact you through email to ask application questions. In part one, check the box to indicate if the project is government or privately owned. Government owned shall mean a state of Connecticut or local government agency, including a school district, municipality, city, county, special district, transit district, joint powers authority, or port authority, owning police purchase of government funds, and a tribal government or native village. Please note that private bus companies under contract to provide public school transportation are eligible to apply as a government-owned project. Part 2A, project summary. At the top, provide a project title and anticipate a project start and end date. All projects must have com potential for completion by April 30th, 2021. Provide a detailed but concise description of the proposed project, including community and air quality benefits. 
It is important to provide information on use of the old vehicles in areas where they operate. Old vehicles refer to the vehicles being replaced. Please note that this section affords the applicant the opportunity to promote the energy, environmental, and economic benefits of the project. Part 2B, Project Documentation. Select the project category being applied for. If more than one category, then a separate application form should be used for each project category. Complete the appropriate section for the source category selected and provide the documentation. For example, if replacing a school bus, you would check the box for B1 and complete section B1. Part 2, B1, on-road heavy-duty vehicles. Provide the number of vehicles being replaced repowered. Submit all required supporting documentation. New for round two is attachment A, fleet information worksheet, which collects information about the old vehicles and their replacement. Attachment A will be discussed and demonstrated later on in the presentation. It is important to ensure that all estimates and spec sheets are attached to the application and that they are legible. Part 2, B2, non-road equipment. Provide the number of pieces of equipment being replaced or repowered. Submit all required supporting documentation. All replacements in this category must be electric. It is important to provide documentation that the equipment has been used more than 500 hours in 12 months preceding the application. Part 2, B3, applies to commercial marine vessels. Provide the number of vessels being repowered or upgraded and the number of propulsion engines and auxiliary engines being replaced repowered. Select the type of replacement repower. Submit all required documentation. Please provide documentation that ferries or tugs have been operating 1,000 or more hours in 12 months preceding the application. Operating logs are acceptable form of documentation. Part 2, B4, shore power for ocean-going vessels. Provide the address of the proposed installation. Indicate if the system will comply with international standards. Submit all required supporting documentation. Please provide documentation demonstrating that the applicant has site control of the proposed infrastructure site. Part 2, B5, freight switchers. Provide the number of freight switchers and number of propulsion engines and generator sets being replaced with power. Only pre-Tier 4 freight switchers are eligible. Select the type of replacement repower. Submit all required supporting documentation. It is important to provide documentation that the locomotive has been operating for 1,000 or more hours in 12 months preceding the application. An operating log is acceptable documentation. Part 2B6, EV charging infrastructure. Complete this section only if the replacement vehicles are electric and also installing associated charging infrastructure. Please indicate the charger type, brand, model, number of chargers, and number of outlets for the project. Applicants must have site control of the installation site and documentation should be submitted. Site control refers to, one, ownership of a leasehold interest in or a right to develop the site for the purpose of constructing the EV charging station. Two, an option to purchase or acquire a leasehold site for such purpose or three, an exclusivity or other business relationship between the applicant and the entity having the right to sell, lease, or grant the applicant the right to possess or occupy a site for such purpose. Part 2C, Proposed Budget Replacement Repowers. This is a new table for this round. I'm going to walk you through the table. Please provide the number of new vehicles, engines, or equipment being purchased with the make, model, and year of each. Group similar units together if possible. Please provide values and totals for every line, applicable line on the budget table. Ensure that all cost estimates and spec sheets are included with the submittal to enable verification of values entered on this sheet. To provide a little clarification on the anticipated BW grant award, this this value should not exceed the program's maximum reimbursement percentage for each type of project. 
For example, replacement of a municipal owned dump truck would be eligible for up to 65% for the total project cost. You cannot request 100% funding under this program. So if the new town, new dump truck would cost $100,000, your anticipated grant award amount would be 65,000. The grantee cost share is the difference between the anticipated award and the project total. There will always be a cost share under this program. Example, if the applicant with the truck above decides to increase their cost share to 50% of the project total, then the anticipated BW award would be adjusted 50% of the project total. Part 2D, proposed budget short power. Provide the number of units along with brand and model. Enter all costs including site prep, installation, and other associated costs. It is not unusual for site prep and installation costs to exceed the cost of the actual shore power equipment. Again, ensure that all our estimates and spec sheets are attached to the application form. Part 2E, balance of funds. Maxima, maximum funding is not guaranteed under this program. The applicant must attest that funds can be secured for the project. Sources of funds and timeline to obtain funds must be provided. For government projects, the budget approval process date is important. Please indicate if the transaction will be a purchase or a lease by checking the appropriate box. Now Lou will be taking over for preferential criteria. So part three preferential criteria really is uh, not a list of eligibility criteria, but it is a list of preferential funding criteria that we use to build our ranking system. So these are very important to fill out. We found in round one, uh, we were missing a lot of the required supporting documentation. So that is the most important thing here. We tried to uh, improve the instructions and improve the form to uh, ensure that you submitted all appropriate documentation. I'm gonna go through each of the preferential criteria right now uh, to give you a little more detail. Uh, first and foremost is uh, the greatest NOx emission per dollar invested. Um, well, what we use here, we use the DEQ, the diesel emissions quantifier, to cross-check any, any calculations submitted by the applicant. Um, if you have calculated a benefit, we want you to indicate so and be prepared to submit an electronic file showing the inputs and results if we request that. Um, you have the option to use any quantifier you wish, but um, you should submit any uh, backup documentation with that. Secondly, um, projects located in environmental justice areas or other communities that have borne a disproportionate share of the adverse impacts of air pollution is a preferred criteria. Uh, what we wanna see here is if uh, in the instructions, we actually uh, listed the website you can go to check to see if the community where the equipment primarily operates is an EJ community. Uh, you would check the box and indicate the location of the equipment. Something that we tweaked for round two is the transformative criteria. We have now added innovative projects to this preferential criteria. Um, and what we mean there is that um, the scope or importance of the project is, is such that it initiates momentum for sustainability and expansion beyond the scope of this program. It has the potential for replication throughout the transportation sector in the state. So, um, you know, as we spoke earlier, we replaced 12 diesel buses at DOT with 12 electric. We considered that transformative. Uh, the methods to implement and to deploy proven technology could be considered, considered innovative. So that's what we're looking for there with innovative projects. Um, also, we're looking for projects located in the New York, New Jersey, Connecticut non-attainment area. Those are three counties down in Southwest Connecticut that have historically had the worst air quality. A new preferential criteria this year um, for this round is the reduction of carbon dioxide or other greenhouse gases. So any project that has a greenhouse gas reduction that has been calculated, um, you should submit the quantifier used and also submit inputs and results with the application. Uh, this is important because the recent public act 18-82 required Connecticut to reduce greenhouse gases to a level that's at least 45% below 2001 levels by 2030. In addition, we're looking for applicants with demonstrated experience for implementing diesel emissions reduction programs. Uh, 
If you have experience, please check the box and also submit uh, documentation or explain how you had that past experience. We're also looking for projects with verified or leveraged cost share exceeding the minimum requirements. Uh, what's very important here is that you only check this box if you're willing to contribute more than the required cost share. Uh, round one, we found that most everyone checked this box, even though they were uh, asking for the maximum VW award. So if you're willing to uh, contribute more, please check and indicate where that funding's coming from and uh, if it's secured. In addition, the final criteria is um, any applicants that have an anti-idling education or outreach program or will develop one as part of the project. Uh, what we want to see here is a summary of the anti-idling program you currently have and uh, documentation that the program exists. Finally, the, the last page of the application, standard terms and conditions. While I say they're standard, they're very important. I reiterate that you should read them and understand them. There are some key points of the program listed here. Um, if we find that awards are based on false statements in the application, uh, we may or we will ask for those to be reimbursed. Uh, also, please do not send these applications directly to the Air Bureau. Uh, submit them to the application specified as the address specified on the application. And also sign and date the form. We received a couple applications that weren't signed or dated. Uh, new this year um, is attachment A, the fleet information worksheet. So what we hope to do here is to gather all the information about the existing fleet and the new fleet um, that would enable us on the deck and to uh, calculate payments and, um, and costs. So this is an Excel-based spreadsheet, um, and you should fill this out if you have on-road vehicles, non-road equipment, ferries, tugs, or freight switchers. I'm going to go through a live demonstration in a second um, as I go over the, the sections of this form. First, to get started, uh, you're going to type in the applicant name and then type in the type of project. It's actually a drop-down box. You have four selections. Uh, depending what you ch choose there, um, other parts of the form will adjust to that category. Um, for an ID for each vehicle, what you do is list each vehicle on a separate line. An ID is just assigned by the applicant for each vehicle. So whatever you want to use to identify that vehicle, uh, you can type it there. The vehicle equipment type and drop-down list will dynamically change based on what you choose for type of project. So I'm going to quickly show you what's happening there. So you're just going to type in company name. When you go to type project, you'll have four selections, uh, on-road, non-road, commercial marine, and replacement repower. So I'm going to do on-road heavy duty right now. ID one, as you can see, the vehicle type equipment is limited to on-road heavy duty vehicles, freight trucks, drage trucks, school bus, shuttle fleet, transit bus. Um, if I were to choose non-road equipment, some of the headings change and you're limited to airport forklift um, non-road equipment. So we'll choose local freight truck now. Go back to the presentation. So now existing fleet, this is where you want to list all the information about all the vehicles being replaced. Um, what I noted here are some of the fields that adjust based on the type of project. So we have some validations built into the form where the engine model year, um, if you put in an invalid number, the spreadsheet will tell you that the engine is not eligible for the program. Um, some of the headings will change depending if you choose on-road or non-road. Uh, field choices will be in a drop-down list and um, uh, some of the calculations adjust depending on the type of equipment chosen. So what you want to do is if you have a vehicle, type in the make, make model, serial number, horsepower of the engine. And when you get to model year, since it's a local freight truck, I believe you can't go beyond uh, was it 94? 90, so, so if I put in 1990 and try to go, it says it's ineligible. So you have to go back and put in an eligible year. So you put in an eligible year and it lets you move forward. If 
primary account of vehicle operation. Now, some vehicles operate throughout the state, and that's fine. Uh, some vehicles like buses um, may be focused in one town or, or two towns. So what we want to know is what, what are the primary one or two towns or, that the vehicle operates in. So for there, you can, you can enter in one city or multiple cities. Uh, VIN, obviously, is self-explanatory. Um, just type some letters there. First vehicle weight, uh, we had some issues first round with people giving us the incorrect vehicle class, so we've automated it where uh, just enter in the gross vehicle weight of the, the vehicle and the vehicle class will fill out automatically. So you're unable to change the vehicle class, so ensure you enter the correct gross vehicle weight rating of the vehicle. Uh, current, view, view, uh, current fuel type. Uh, most of them are going to be diesel, so choose diesel. I don't think we can replace electric anyways. Uh, what you want to do is enter your annual fuel usage. Annual miles. Annual miles in Connecticut. Um, if it's a vehicle that operates in multiple states, uh, we want an estimate of the miles operated in Connecticut here. So in this case, we'll assume this operates in Connecticut the entire time. Annual idling hours is also an estimate of um, um, hours that the vehicle spends idling. They see the miles per gallon is automatically calculated once you enter in the fuel usage and the miles uh, operated. And miles per gallon changes to uh, gallons per hour for non-road equipment and other sources that obviously are not miles per gallon. Um, the new fleet is basically the same thing, uh, a little bit less information, some of the headings change, uh, vehicle class will be repopulated, uh, fuel choices will be in a drop down, and uh, the added thing here is that we want the estimated total cost of each individual vehicle um, minus the ancillary costs, so uh, the number here should agree with part 2C of the application, so ensure that that's filled out and uh, coincides with the um, part 2C. Uh, so I'll just quickly show you what this looks like filled out. Um, during your horsepower, um, model year should be uh, one model, or is it two model years or less? It should be, the new model year should be the year that you're replacing the vehicle in or one model year ahead. So if you're doing the project next year, it could be a 2020 model or a 2021 model. It can be older for grade. Yeah. So then you just choose your fuels and enter your cost. Uh, and do that for each vehicle you have. Um, what we want you to do right now is to print this out and submit it with your application. Uh, if it's a large fleet, we may ask you for an electronic submittal of this form, so please uh, maintain a copy of it as uh, we may ask you for the form. Um, so, so some of the main points is that it's critical that the forms are complete and all supporting information is submitted with the application. Um, if you receive an email or a phone call from us, please respond as promptly as possible. Even if it's just a matter of uh, acknowledging that you received the email or phone call, uh, it'll help us uh, uh, proceed with your application. Uh, as I said, attachment A, we may ask for uh, electronic copies, so please be prepared to submit those if, re if it's requested from you. And uh, due to the tight time constraints of this uh, round, um, unresponsive applicants will have their applications denied. So please be prompt and please monitor your email. Um, most communication will be through email for this, for this uh, program. Quick overview of the application process. Uh, when you submit an application, it's received downstairs in our permit processing office. Um, what you'll get immediately is a uh, automatic email notification that's been received by the department. Um, after that, it will come upstairs to us on the fifth floor and uh, will be assigned to a, a case manager. 
Within about seven days of our receipt, we're going to review the application to make sure all the boxes are checked and all the information is, is submitted. We're going to do a little administrative sufficiency review. Um, if everything's there, we'll, submit, we'll send an email uh, explaining we're going to conduct a technical review on the application. If anything's missing, we'll send an email at first to ask for the information. Um, after that, if there's no response, we're going to send a formal letter after seven days. And after that, uh, we'll deny the application. So you have about 14 days or so to get the information to us or to respond to us. And if we don't hear anything, we're going to move on uh, due to the tight time constraints. Uh, we're going to try to process all applications within 45 days at, from the end of the solicitation period. So um, this will be uh, much tighter than the first round. So it's very important that you uh, are responsive to our information requests. Some information about uh, what happens after the award. Uh, you may get a letter and it may be less than originally requested. Uh, that may be based on the number of applications you receive and the funds available. Uh, the applicant has the uh, right to accept or deny the award if it does not meet their proposed project. After that, DEEP will work with all the awardees to develop uh, project management plans which will outline the project requirements and milestones we expect to happen. Um, project and final, final documentation must be completed by April 30th, 2021 to be eligible for reimbursement. During the, during the uh, implementation of the project, uh, we are requesting semi-annual progress reports to be submitted and we have a report template that is already posted on our website. It's a fairly simple form and uh, just gives us um, an update on, on what's happening with the project. All vehicles being replaced um, need to be rendered inoperable. Um, this is outlined in the management plans that are, are developed after the award, um, but it's important that you remember to uh, document it with pictures and, um, and certify that they have been destroyed. Uh, for engine replacements, it's cutting a three inch hole in the engine block. For a vehicle replacement, in addition to cutting the three inch hole, uh, you need to disable the chassis by cutting the vehicle frame rails completely in half. Also, the awardee is required to dis demonstrate payment for the project and submit required documentation before receiving the funds. The awardee require is required to keep the new re equipment in operation for a minimum of three years or replace it with equal or better equipment during that time frame. If EV infrastructure is installed with the electric replacement or repower and it's publicly accessible, then it must comply with the Connecticut General Statutes. So now we're going to go into uh, just some answers to common questions, which uh, we get over and over again. So we're just going to give you answers. So our goal is to announce award decisions within 45 days after the September 16th, 2019 application deadline. This is a competitive grant program. NOx emission reductions are one part of the criteria that applications will be ranked against. Uh, see the application form for the list of preferential criteria. There are no targets for dollar per NOx reduced, but cost effectiveness is also an evaluation criteria. Partial awards may be issued and maximum funding is not guaranteed. Projects initiated prior to filing an application for the program are not eligible for funding. This includes projects in an already approved municipal budget. If an awardee decides to cancel a project, notification must be sent to DEEP as soon as possible so that the funds can be made available to other applicants within a time frame sufficient to allow completion of the substitute projects. There are also no limits on the amount of funding any one project or individual entity can receive. For review consistency, DEEP has chosen to use EPA's diesel emissions quantifier to calculate NOx emission benefits. Applicants may use any available tool but should be prepared to submit documentation. So just going over some quick contact information. Um, general questions about the program, uh, our plan or the trust settlement should be emailed directly to us. Uh, you, can, you can find a link on our VW website or our direct email is listed there. Um, after you submit an application to us, a deep contact person will be assigned to you on the notice of administrative sufficiency. Uh, you can contact this person with specific questions regarding your application. 
Again, just some more contact information. Follow us on the website. Um, sign up for our VW email distribution list. Uh, that's where you're going to get first notification of any future grant programs, including future EVSE programs. Um, the VW website will also be updated with those future opportunities. And um, shameless plug to follow Drive Clean Connecticut on Facebook. So now we're going to try to answer some of the questions that have come in. Um, we may not get to everything, but if you have a question, please type it into the chat window uh, so everyone can see it. I'm going to look through my own private messages here just to see if I received anything, but if you can do it to everyone, that would be helpful. Um, I think Keisha has a couple questions she can probably answer right now. I do. Um, so one of the questions that came in was, from Michael, what is the solicitation total amount available for fall 2019 DARA? And it is the six, approximately $679,000 with the possibility of increasing that depending on the number of applications that come in. And, and what that means is we do have funding left over from previous years of uh, DARA funding that were unused. And if there are, or if there's demand for funding beyond what we were allocated this year, we could access those funds. So the potential to increase the 679,000 is there. Um, just an easy question here. If the PowerPoint, I, I know we were garbled at the beginning, sorry for that, but uh, the PowerPoint pres presentation and recording of this webinar will be available on the R RVW website uh, within a week or so. And so someone that wanted a copy of the DERA slide, uh, you'll have that in a week or so. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Michael also asked, will leased equipment be eligible for 2019 DERA? Uh, they will be, but they have to be leased to own vehicles. It cannot just be a lease that's turned in at the end of the lease period. Okay, we have a question from Peter. Uh, comment that municipal municipalities have a long funding process and would not be able to receive, receive funding within the application period. Note that you have 18 months to get the project done after the award period, and we allowed 18 months with the uh, knowledge that a municipal budget could be enacted after the award period and still have the better part of a year to complete the project. A uh, question from Randy, uh, should a vehicle replacement info allow for an electric drive unit or traction motor as opposed to an engine? Yes, on attachment A, you are able to select electric or hydrogen if it's a hydrogen fueled electric uh, replacement, so that is an option. I have a question from Peter regarding the calculations for GHD reductions. Uh, GHD, as I mentioned before, it's also known as CO2, and that's calculated on the deck. It could all, it's also calculated in the uh, HDVC uh, calculation, which will give you something called GHD reductions. Uh, uh, one of the questions was, do applicants have to apply separately for DARA in VW, even if the project is the exact same? And the answer is yes, because there are two separate projects, I mean, two separate programs being evaluated independently, you would have to submit an application for each, um, for each program. The forms okay. are very the, similar. Yes, so the for, application forms are pretty similar, so completing both shouldn't be, you know, too time consuming or involved. Um, but we would require two separate applications. So I think we had a question from Pete. Did we deal with the municipalities question? Uh, oh, we did this one here? Yes. Oh, okay. All right. Sorry. Um, there was a question. We explain engine model year, current year, or one year later. Applicants can't purchase new vehicles that have been operating for a year or so. No, they cannot. It, any replacement vehicle has to be a new vehicle. It has to have an engine uh, model year 
in the year of the project, so whatever year the project is being completed in, the replacement vehicle has to be that model year or the next year, the it following year. year. So, no, is it one? No. Following year. So if you're completing the project in 2020, it can be a 2020 model year or a 2021 model year. Uh, for the question, did you answer the Kevin White question? Do you do applicants have to send an application for both BW and Dara? Yes. Yeah. All right, second. Uh, timeline for project completion, did you get to that? Uh, no. No. Um, Randy, timeline for project completion, is it sufficient specifically for vehicle delivery? And I think what we did in round one is that when we worked on our, our um, management plans with the awardee, um, we specified that the date uh, for completion was the date, but um, we were flexible flexible to adjust that date depending on the type of project and the lead time to receive vehicles. So what we're looking for is progress and uh, responsiveness uh, when we get to that point. Um, another question was round one got a low score from public from national public interest research group because we did not prioritize EVs and e-buses and accepted diesel others and other CO2 emissions fuels. Why do we differ from other states in this way? Um, so I, I wouldn't say we differ. We differ from some states, but not all. Um, one thing with that research uh, paper they gave no credit to the projects or for the projects that were actually funded. So we were actually being evaluated based on how the program is set up versus what the program actually funded at the end. So if just by accepting applications for diesel, we got a negative score with no um, no credit really being given for the fact that the majority of our funding were for electric projects. Um, the way we wrote the mitigation plan when we started out, we allowed for flexibility and an open competitive process to evaluate the, type, the projects that were submitted. And uh, what we've done is allowed for a higher reimbursement amount for electric projects and alt fuels over diesel. But at the end of the day, what we do is um, evaluate the projects that have come in and, and typically electrification projects and alt fuel projects end up being ranked favorably as compared to diesel projects. Uh, there was another question that says, why are we funding infrastructure for EVs after this program if we want to get EVs with this funding? So the EVSE program is separate and apart from the diesel program. Anyone who is proposing to replace a diesel vehicle with an electric vehicle under the diesel program can also get funding for EV infrastructure along with that replacement. The EVSE program that we expect to launch at a later time is solely for um, electric vehicle infrastructure, not tied to the uh, replacement or repowering of vehicles with electric uh, engines or electric run drivetrain. I um, had a question about preferential criteria for greater cost share. So is there a better chance if there's a greater cost share? And um, that is a preferential criteria. And yes, if there is a, a bigger cost share uh, provided, that will more favorably uh, rank the project. Uh, hydrogen off-road vehicles eligible like forklifts. Uh, those are eligible to be the new vehicle. Yes, they can replace uh, diesel. Huh? Only electric. Uh, Non-road can only be replaced with electric. Okay. Look, look at the DIRA application if you want to do that. that. Okay. All right. Stand corrected. 
So there's a question here that says uh, EV charging timetable. Um, I'm not sure if this is referring to the EVSE uh, grant program. If it is, um, I do not have a specific time as to when this program it will be launched. The expectation is that it will be la uh, launched following the release of, release of the EV roadmap and hopefully before the end of 2019. Question about Dura funds being stacked with federal grant incentives, uh, clean diesel targeted air shed. Uh, Dura funds, uh, it's Diesel Emission Reduction Act. So this program is for reducing diesel emissions. So whatever you're uh, uh, pro proposing for Dura funding has to start with a diesel vehicle or a group of diesel vehicles replaced with either newer diesel or alt fuels or electric. I hope that comes close. I, I'm not having trouble in, interpreting that question. Another question is, what is considered a significant reduction in GHG or CO2? And um, our intent is really to rent the applications that come in based on um, based on their GHG reduction. So essentially, um, the project with the highest GHG reductions will be ranked the highest and we will proceed down the list in, in that order. Um, so as far as significant, it's really just us looking at what the GHG reductions are and ranking them from highest to lowest. Is this the last round of funding? By no means. Uh, we have, uh, I, right now we have about $42 million left in the, um, in Connecticut's allocation. Uh, with the $7.5 million we're expecting to spend this round. We have 10 years. We'll have, still have $35 million and we have 10, well, maybe about another seven years or so to spend that down. Um, so I expect that we will have additional rounds of funding after this. Did we answer uh, what tool to use for GHG calculations? We're using the deck for that as well. We're using the deck for uh, all calculations for any eligible pro projects submitted. What we have done is use the, for all fields, we have used the A fleet tool to establish a baseline for the new vehicle. For the new vehicle, and transfer that to the deck to to determine the emissions reduction. Uh, we have a question about cost share. The cost share funding can come from any source except from DIRA funds. You cannot use DIRA funds to help your cost share for VW. Similarly, you cannot use VW funds to help your cost share for uh, VW. For DIRA, you can't use VW funds to, to cost share for DIRA and vice versa. These are excluded in both programs. Otherwise, for VW, you, could, you can use any other federal grants or any other sources to meet your cost share except DIRA. So Michael asked a follow-up about the stacking. So regarding stacking, if DIRA funds 45% of an all-electric truck, can another grant be stacked on top of that to cover additional project cost, even if it exceeds the incremental cost of the clean transportation technology? Okay. And DIRA, I would have to look that up. 
there are, there are more restrictions on the supplemental funding for DERA than there are for BW. So, um, Michael, if you send that, please send that to us um, by the email and I'll address it and I'll have an answer for you probably by the end of the day. And then when do you expect the next round of funding to become available? That's, that's not going to happen until, um, next round of diesel funding is not going to happen until we get through this, this round here. Um, but like Keisha said, EBSC funding round should be available um, sometime late this year, early next uh, year. Yeah. Um, if anyone else has any questions, type them in now. Um, otherwise, oh, I, I think that is it. Um, like I said, the webinar and um, will be recorded and the slides will be posted on our website. Uh, you can find them there in a week or so. And if you have any questions, please email us. That's it. Thanks for attending. <laughs>